there's my title there. I guess I probably should have inserted non-trivial into that title, because you can imagine there would be trivial correspondences, but we'll, we'll carry on. So that's what we're looking at. And so the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to um, basically put up two opposing hypotheses, one called meme and one called anti-meme, subject to two assumptions. And then we're going to apply some tests to these hypotheses and see how they actually pan out uh, and uh, then draw some conclusions. So um, what are these uh, assumptions? I call them imps and ogre. So the imps assumption is that um, interpretive models give perception from states. So what do I mean by that? So um, if we start by thinking, well, it is the brain that is responsible for consciousness, um, then, well, consciousness is full of relationships. They give you the geometry, the field of view, you have gestalt phen phenomena, you have relationships between objects and so forth. Um, so if the brain is doing that, then the brain must somehow be giving rise to a sort of interpretive model for its own states, for how you interpret its own states, so that you actually have the relational contents of your experiences. So that's, that's the imps assumption. Ogre assumption is object grouping awareness. So it's simply that when we walk around the world or things come to mind, um, we are aware of relationships between these things. And this, th these relationships, they are a part of our conscious experience. So if you then degrade that conscious experience somehow, you are, or degrade those relationships, you are then degrading conscious experience itself to some extent. Only to some extent, because you've got other things going on as well. But uh, with respect to objects, if you're losing that content, then you're reducing your conscious experience. So those are the two uh, assumptions. Um, and uh, interpretive relational model, well, it's hierarchical because at some level you've got the perception of the field of view itself. So you have a uh, geometry of the field of view, the brain must be determining that geometry. We know this because when you sleep and you dream, there's no image on the retina, and yet you could be dreaming of being in this ray room. So it is, it is the brain itself that is giving rise to that geometry. So uh, that's just kind of at the primary level, but there's also, you know, it's also to do with other areas of the brain, so auditory structure as well, and other, other structures. But then it's a, it's a hierarchy, because higher up you then have relationships between objects, because once you have the field of view, then you have objects in the field of view, and we also experience relationships between objects. So you can imagine the interpretive relational model is hierarchical in that sense. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce the two opposing hypotheses. Um, the first one is called MEAN, which stands for Minimum Expected Entropy Model. So the hypothesis is that consciousness is the minimum expected entropy model interpretation of system states as determined by the system's bias. And this corresponds to um, what's been published in the literature, uh, the fundamental postulate of expected flow entropy minimization. And there is the postulate, you can find that in the literature, it simply says, um, if we su suppose that consciousness is given by an interpreted, is given by the interpretation of system states, then amongst the infinitely many possible interpretations, consciousness is given by some form of minimum expected entropy model interpretation of system states that yields experiences free of unnecessary discontinuities whilst exhibiting the intrin intrinsic structural regularities of probable system states. It's quite a lot in there, but it is in the papers. Um, and the important thing about the meme uh, hypothesis is it's the one that depends on the system bias for this talk. Anti-meme, that hypothesis is that there's something else in the brain, has nothing to do with system bias, which is determining the interpretive model. Um, so it's, you know, it's basically nothing to do with bias. You can have anything you like, independent of the bias. That's the anti-mean hypothesis. I'm going to uh, skip this slide. Um, so this goes back to work that's actually been in the literature for over 10 years now, uh, expected flow entropy minimization. People who know this work will probably recognize this. Uh, this definition here is slightly different to the usual one because it's at the object level. 
Um, but basically, what is this thing? So you can see there that there's a, an, an R, if the clicker is going to give me a pointer, there's an R there. And that is this relational mod, uh, model between objects, so object one, two, three, blah, blah, blah. And this is, these are values between zero and one here. Point with your finger, is your finger. That, that working? Okay, here it is. Here's the R, okay. And this F here, this is a, a system state. Essentially, it's uh, at this level, uh, for this way in which we're in applying the theory, uh, it's simply what objects are present for that system state. And what is this? It's basically a, a kind of measure for how well the system state uh, fits the model, or the other way around, if you like, how well the model fits that particular system state. And for people who know this work, I'll just point out one small variation to the, the usual definition, and that is that here, when we do apply this metric, we restrict the model uh, to the objects that are actually present. And uh, there's a, basically, we're, we're measuring the distance when, uh, uh, between the model, but only the part of the model that is relevant to that state. That's what we're doing there. Okay, now here's an important point. The brain is very, very biased towards being in certain system states over other states. You know, we walk around the world, we see things, things come to mind all the time. Um, and we can represent that bias, at least, yeah, we can represent that bias using a probability distribution. And once you have a probability distribution, um, then you can calculate expected quantities. And so we can calculate the expected value of this flow entropy that I just mentioned earlier and get this expected flow entropy. Um, and then according to the, 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 the theory, the, the, the model, um, the system itself is then determining a particular relational model and it's the arg minimum of expected flow entropy minimization and it corresponds to the fundamental postulate. Um, now, the only problem with this is that it's quite tricky to calculate. It's quite computationally expensive. But there is a, at this level in the structure, there is actually a nice surrogate for it, which is computationally much cheaper. At, at least initial work is showing that this surrogate looks to be promising. So if we, there's this example here where we basically get the, the model out using both expected flow tension minimization and the surrogate, and then we plot the um, uh, uh, values in the two models against one another. And you can see that there's actually quite good co uh, correlation there. Pearson, the Pearson correlation coefficient of 0 0.915, which isn't bad. OK, so with all of that, we're now ready to do our first test of mean versus anti-mean. So what we did is we took 200 photographs of the world around us. Imagine these photographs as being the thing that the person is experiencing in the world, right? Um, and um, we selected 25 objects. Um, we then uh, calculated R from what we just showed on the last slide. And we also applied a threshold, rounded everything up um, above that threshold up to one and everything below down in order to get an adjacency matrix. And so we could then plot this graph here on the left. So here we have these, these lines there, the colors don't mean anything. It's just a way so that the lines don't all just merge into each other and you can't see what's connected to what. So don't worry about the colors. The point is this, this is an, a, a graph of an adjacency matrix and on the left is the one determined by mean. And then we have another one on the right, which is gonna be for anti-meme. We've tried to give anti-meme a bit of a helping hand by having almost double the amount number of uh, strong relationships for the anti-meme hypothesis. So what does this actually mean then when we go back to the, the photographs and what people would be experiencing? So let's say on the left it's Alice, on the right it's Bob. And uh, Alice then, for the first one, experiences seven strong relationships. So computer is strongly related to the glasses, the coffee cup is strongly related to the tabletop, 
Bob, on the other hand, zero. He's not experiencing any strong relationships. So that coffee cup for Bob, it might as well be a jellyfish on the table. He doesn't really see any connections between these things. Let's have another go. Next one. Eight strong relationships for Alice, zero for Bob. Next one. Six strong relationships for Alice, zero for Bob. Next one. Five for Alice, zero for Bob. Next one. 20 for Alice zero for Bob. So despite Bob having double the number of strong relationships in his model, I mean, poor Bob. Well, it's a very confusing place for Bob. <laughs> so um, the conclusion then is that um, anti-meme says that there is something completely independent of system bias in the brain that is determining um, the interpretive model. But strong relationships between objects that exclude those determined by system bias will rarely ever be experienced. And uh, so I give this example then, sort of analogy. Bob sees his wife, Alice, walking towards him. The name Alice pops into Bob's head because of system bias. But under the anti-meme hypothesis, Bob does not experience any connection between the person walking towards him and the name Alice. It could have been the name John Smith for, you know, what it actually meant to him. So this is rather like Bob having dementia. I mean, it's not exactly the same. And with dementia, it would be like the relational model would be collapsing altogether, but um, rather than it simply being the wrong uh, model. But, uh, you know, for Bob, the world is a very confusing place. So under the ogre assumption, this means that meme would beat anti-meme. OK, so that was a little bit of a contrived example, perhaps. Um, but we can do something which is a little bit closer to experimental psychology, perhaps. So we can actually do it, come up with a formula for how many strong relationships you would be experiencing um, if the relational, uh, the um, interpretive relational model was determined uniformly at random by the system. So I, I'm a little bit short of time, so I, am I short of time? No, I'm okay actually for time. I'm okay for time. So um, X then is going to be the number of strong relationships a person would experience per system state um, if the uh, interpretive relational model, subject to these numbers, uh, is determined uniformly at random by the system. N is the number of objects that the person knows, or how many objects there are in the relational model. So that would be a large number because we know thousands and thousands of objects. I mean, think about text on a page, you know, you know, you, you can recognize 500 words just at sight. So that's 500 things that you can just recognize straight away. So n is going to be a large number. n is the typical number of objects each object is strongly related to, typically. And k is the typical number of objects that a person experiences per state. And we can actually just use some undergraduate probability theory, uh, uh, linearity of expectation and come up with this formula for x, the expectation of x. So we can just put some numbers into this and um, let's say n is a thousand, it would be bigger than a thousand. M, m, let's choose 10 and k, let's choose 10. You put that in to the formula and you get an expected number of strong relationships that you would experience of 0.45 which is really low. I mean, that's, I mean, you think about what's going on in this room, you're, you're seeing relationships between the, the, uh, the screen and the wall and the lights and the ceiling and uh, your hands and your arm and the chairs and the floor. And, you know, it's like gestalt phenomena, you're experiencing all of these things. Uh, me and the, my, the sound of my voice go together. Um, you know, there's no, there's no uh, weird, Jelly, a giant jellyfish in the middle of the room, which everybody is kind of uh, aware of as being very strange. So um, 0 0.4 is kind of really weird. It's like the Bob situation again. It's, it's very, very low. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we have a similar conclusion. Um, so exactly what values we should use should actually be determined by experimental psychology, perhaps. But for this test, at least, um, test two uh, um, and the ogre assumption suggests that mean beats anti-mean because 
the interpretive relational model, uh, a system determines under mean, will give a much, will give many more than 0 0.5, 0 0.45 strong rel object relationships per have relationships expected per system state. Okay, so there's something there which can be done, you know, uh, a little bit more concretely perhaps, but still comes up with the same answer. So, overall conclusion then is that um, mean beats anti mean under the ints and ogre assumptions. Uh, there is a correspondence, non trivial correspondence, I should say, between consciousness and system bias. And this is a uh, a bit that, that might rattle a few cages, perhaps. So, therefore, the most obvious candidate for what it is in a conscious system that determines the interpretive relational model is his own system bias, since any other candidate would anyway have to result in a similar model under the ogre assumption. So even if it's something else in the brain that is giving rise to the interpretive model, it's still got to correspond very closely to the uh, one that the system bias would give you. Else you're going to be a bob, and you're going to have a lot less consciousness than somebody who has a, the, the, uh, a model such under the mean hypothesis. And this is evidence in favour of the fundamental postulate of EFE minimization that was uh, presented at the beginning of the talk. So thank you very much, and uh, that's it. Thanks.